So welcome to another National Insect Week podcast uh, for 2014. I'm joined by Darren Mann, who is the head of the Life Collections of the Oxford University Museum of Natural History. So thank you, Darren, for joining us today. Welcome. First of all, what is it like to be head of the Life Collections at the museum? What do your daily tasks involve? Um, well, primarily my job is to manage the collections, make them accessible and safe. Um, so I spend a lot of my time managing the staff under me, making sure that the work that we've got to do is being done, that there's enough money to do the work we need to do, find more money for the work we want to do, and dealing with anything from public inquiries to sort of inquiries from other museums, and either transferring those inquiries to members of staff to deal with, or if they're fun, then I try and get to do them myself. Now, I, I'm sort of more an administrator than anything else, although I do do sort of my own research and curation. Um, but back in the day, my job basically was just recurating collections, making them safe, accessible, and identifying stuff, which I mean, it's my favourite bit of the job, is identification. That's the bit I really enjoy. And I still get to do it now, but... Not so much as I used to. So you start your day, someone yeah. puts down a pile of insects in front of you, yeah. and you'd have to work your way through them? Yeah, well, a, a mix of sort of samples from research projects, from inquiries. So today, one of the jobs I've had is identifying that bee. There you go. A tiny, a tiny <laughs> bee. A little black bee that somebody found flying into their bathroom. And so someone's come along, handed this to yeah, you. That came in today. So um, I mean, unfortunately, it was it was uh, past releasing when, when it came in here. It was a little bit uh, Murray bun, should we right. say? <laughs> um, and then so we pinned it, and we'll get the data which we'll add to the specimen because mm -hmm. the specimen is good to have, but the data that goes with it is equally as important. And then we've identified it as Hylaeus. And then I've actually used that to teach um, a couple of the staff here about bee identification because they've not experienced it. Oh, okay. So as well as doing the identification myself, I'm happy I know what it is. Then we've passed it on to them with the keys and then I've sort of trained them up in how to identify the bee. How do you go about identifying something? It's a species. Um, You've been given an insect and now your mission is to find out... Well, I mean, if you know what order it is, the, the thing is, is that just in the UK alone there's, what, 23,500 species of insect. And you can't know all species. It's impossible. Um, there are some amazing entomologists out there, far better than I, that can pretty much tell you what genus anything is you hand over to them. But um, the best thing to know is the literature. So although you might not know what genus you're dealing with or what family, if you know the book that can tell you that, that's the thing to remember. So don't try and learn everything. Just try and learn the literature you need to identify things. So these books, it's the keys? Yeah, it's the identification guide. So for a lot of groups, there are quite modern identification guides. For some, you have to go back 50 or 100 years to get the best identification guide. And then there's a load of published papers and things like that. So understanding the literature is probably as important as understanding the organisms themselves. I mean, I specialise in beetles, and in particular dung beetles and oil beetles in the UK. Outside of the UK, I only do dung beetles. Um, and I know the literature quite well. And I, you could give me a dung beetle for most parts of the world, and I'll know what papers I need to identify just off the top of my head. Mm. Might not be able to identify it because there's a lot of new species out there. Um, but in the UK, I can manage most groups of insects with a few days and a, mi a good microscope in the literature. So this is the culmination this is your career you're now yeah. managing people yeah but how did you start out how did you get into as a precocious little kid who went into a museum when I was 14 and asked if I could do voluntary work and that was the first time you had experience no, I, well, I had jam jars full of caterpillars and you know all the usual things that most kids did and lots of pets mm -hmm. um, and I was really into cockroaches when I was younger I get I was given hissing cockroaches from my junior school teacher and they kind of inspired me to get interested in cockroaches. But then I soon learned that there weren't that many cockroaches in the UK. So I kind of branched out with the help of people in the museum into hoverflies, sawflies, beetles, bugs, and all the other sort of insect groups. Um, and then when I was 15, I did my two week work experience in a museum and that was it for me. I just wanted to be a museum entomologist from then on. So it just... It just seemed like the most amazing job in the world. Basically, you got you were surrounded by just loads and loads of insect specimens that you could just go and look at with the microscope and there was just these amazing libraries around you that could tell you everything you wanted to know. 
you also do field work to bring in the collection. Yes, I mean, I, I try to get out to the, abroad at least once a year, and usually Southeast Asia at the moment, that's where my research interests are, and I'm looking at dung beetle ecology, biology, distribution patterns, taxonomy, all the usual sort of stuff. Um, but I travel around the UK a lot as well, collecting beetles. So last night I was at a farm setting out a dung beetle ecology experiment till about 10 o'clock at night, mm -hmm. and this weekend I'm off to Northumbria to look for another rare beetle. That highlights something quite important, the fact that well, you do the curation, the identification, yeah. but you're also involved really first-hand in the research. They are integral to each other. It depends on the research you're doing. If you're just researching Drosophila mm -hmm. and looking at genetics, then you don't really need to have any taxonomic background or taxonomic knowledge, other than the fact you're working on Drosophila melanogaster. If you're doing any form of ecology using any animal plant group even, you need to be able to identify the things you're studying because how do you study something if you don't know what it is? And how do you know that what you're studying and calling it species A is the same one that the other people are calling species B? So you need this taxonomic information because it's the foundation of all biology. If you don't know what a species is, you can't really study it. So although we've still got a lot of naming to do, there are lots and lots of new species out there, you need sort of at least taxonomic support in any ecological project so you can get your identifications accurate. It's quite funny. I mean, there was one paper that came out a few years ago which was talking about beetles in Southeast Asia, um, primarily on Sulawesi, and it listed their species list, what they'd done their ecology on, and about a third of the species have never been found in Sulawesi before. And what had happened is they'd used an identification guide that wasn't suited to the country they were working in, well, the area they were working in, and there was loads of misidentifications. There were species that we know to be endemic to Borneo that they'd found on Sulawesi. Now you might go, wow, they've discovered something new on Sulawesi. Um, and I contacted them and, and I pointed out some of the, well, I, I asked the question, you know, how did you identify and what did you use? And the literature they used was basically literature published on the Bornean fauna. So they used Bornean identification guides to identify Sulawesi and beetles. Doesn't work like that, unfortunately. If they just said, you know, species A, species B, species C, it would have been fine, but because they put species names, then, you know, according to them, at least one or two species suddenly weren't endemic to Borneo, they were actually found in Sulawesi as well, which is kind of questionable, certainly with the species they were dealing with. And it was just misidentification or putting too much faith in literature that wasn't suitable for what they were doing. And again, if they'd have brought in a taxonomist, or at least somebody understood the you know, biology, ecology, distribution of the species in their area, I don't think they'd have made such a mistake. So the, uh, the accuracy, the validity, the importance of research is really assured by taxonomists? Quite often. I mean, if I see a, a, a research paper that lists a whole heap of species, I quite often look to see who did the identifications. Because if the identifications are, are done by somebody who you know has published on identification before, you know, taxonomic research or good ecology papers, um, you sort of like think, well, the research must be good. But when you find out that half their species are misidentified, you kind of start to question the validity of the rest of their research. You know, if they can't get the identifications correct, you know, how can you be talking about the ecosystem service provision of a beetle if you not, can't even talk about the beetle correctly? I think it's, yeah, key to most biology. Well, certainly ecology, where you're dealing with species. If you don't know what it is, you can't really be studying the ecology of it. So you're working with a lot of species, a lot of specimens yeah. in your museum. Do you know how many, uh, roughly how many insect mm. specimens are in your collections here? Between seven and eight million. Seven and eight million? Yeah. So my question was going to be, which ones are your favourite? But <laughs> that's, uh... um, Dung beetles, definitely. Cockroach is second. But I've got some dung beetle specimens in particular, and actually the drawer over here is one of them, because this is one of my, my treasured... not. I think one of my most treasured memories of being in this museum, and that's that little box of beetles there. So a classic entomology collections drawer, yeah. where coming out of the cabinet with a glass lid, yeah. lots of boxes, neatly lined up insects. So this series of, these are British dung beetles, this whole dung beetle thing again with me, but these specimens were actually quite interesting. There was a, a book published, it's on my shelf over here. This is Entomological Britannica, published in 1802 by Thomas Marsham. 200 year old book still yeah. relevant today <laughs> yeah definitely that's the thing about taxonomy you publish taxonomy you're relevant forever mm. publish genomics you're 
out of date within 10 years sort yeah. of thing. It's, it's taxonomy live forever. So if you want to go down in history, be a taxonomist. Definitely be a taxonomist. And in here, it's, this is uh, actually the copy that was owned by F.W. Hope, who was the father of our collections, the founder. Um, and you see it's sort of like really nicely annotated, of the genus Rhynchites, taken in Oxford in 1820. It's a really lovely piece of work. And I was looking at this book, making a list of dung beetles that occurred in Britain and their, you know, their history. So what names people called them 100, 200 years ago. So we can understand distribution patterns. Some species that were recorded 200 years ago have gone extinct. And you, you want to get the data of where they occur to understand why they went extinct. And I was reading this book and I actually found reference to the gear troopies, which are these, the sort of door beetles as they're commonly referred to. And Hope says, now of the genus gear troopies, purchased at Marsham's sale in 1820. So Marsham, this is the guy who wrote this book in 1802, he went bankrupt, had to sell his insect collection at auction, and everybody had assumed it had been bought by a chap called Stevens and was in the Natural History Museum. Um, but there were parts of his collection we couldn't find, and it was a bit of a mystery. You know, it's like, well, we must have lost them, or maybe they were destroyed before it went to sale. And after reading Hope's comments, I went to our collection and actually found this set of beetles here, and all of these were ones that refer to in Thomas Marsham's book of 1802. So these, it's kind of a, a detective series. It was, right? yeah. It was, a, persons. it was a brilliant, yeah, it was a brilliant find that was. I was really, well, I wouldn't say pleased with myself, but just really excited because Thomas Marsham was just like one of the fathers of British coleoptera studies. So one of the first guys to study the British fauna. And to find some of his specimens that were believed lost or destroyed was just amazing for me. And they're beautiful, and they're still in good condition. I mean, most of them have still got all their legs. I mean, in fact, the the Tefeus, the um, the minotaur, minotaur beetle. beetle, yeah, is has still got it, all its tarsi and its antennae, and that's over two hundred years old. That mm -hmm. specimen. So yeah, finding things like that, and I mean, that's probably why they're amongst my favourite beetles. Is just the history associated with those particular specimens. So it's not the species; it's the specimens that are kind of interesting there. We've heard these. These are the kind of the day-to-day -day work that you're doing, there's something new that always seems to pop up. Oh, definitely. It's fantastic. What, how can new budding taxonomists get involved in this? If someone is hearing this and thinking, that sounds fascinating, how, how could they get involved? Um, there's, there's lots of ways. I mean, there are several um, entomological societies. So, I mean, the Royal Entsoc's an obvious one, but there's the British Entomological and Natural History Society, there's the coleopteris, there's the bug group, there's um, like local natural history societies, and all of these often have field meetings that you can go along to. And certainly with the British Entomological and Natural History Society, um, they hold about maybe 15 or 20 field trips a year. And anybody can turn up to these, you don't actually have to be a member. And if you go to their website, you can find out the details. And you turn up at these things, and generally it's a, a load of old men to be quite honest, most you know the demographics of entomology tend to be older gentlemen, um, but these guys will be willing to teach you, like literally spill their brains out into yours, because we want new and young entomologists to come on board and start continuing what we've been doing. So I mean, we're you know we're building on the work that Thomas Marsham did in 1802. Still, we're adding new species to Britain. We're still looking at distribution patterns and the taxonomy, ecology, biology. So, you know, we need more, we need the next generation to come along. And so most entomologists are quite willing to take you on, you know, as almost like a student and be a mentor to you, to teach you things. And then obviously there's museums. I mean, there's museums scattered throughout the UK that usually have easily accessible collections. Um, so approach your local museum, approach the local natural history society, local wildlife trust, often we're in workshops and things like that. So there's lots of easy ways of sort of at least getting your foot into the door, but to, to do it um, as a profession is a bit more difficult and just requires a lot of dedication, a lot of time. I mean, I spent 25, 30 years learning about beetles and insects in general, and I still consider myself a bit of an amateur. That's but, a problem when you've got eight million specimens yeah, to work through. Yeah, I job. mean, we're always learning. That's what makes entomology so amazing is no matter, you know, you can sit in your garden and make discoveries about insects, you know, biology, ecology or whatever. You know, we're still discovering new species to science in the UK, let alone abroad. Well, 
Thank you, Darren. That was fascinating insight into taxonomy and curation of uh, the insects at the museum. You can follow Darren at Blatterman, double T, double N, on Twitter. Yeah. You can also come down to the Oxford University uh, Natural History Museum. There's a great entomology collection here that yeah. we everybody can see. Yeah, just drop us a line and book an appointment. So, thank you very much. You're welcome.